And this is Dr. Kalen here um, with the Nobel Prize Award that we have followed closely, many of us in clinic. I was in the middle of clinic when he got the award. It's really my pleasure to, um, to present him here. I remember very well the day on October 7, 2019, when he received that call and um, you know, asked me to call him a bit uh, later and uh, several, the two accidents I almost got in on the road to um, Dana Farber. And, uh, you know, I had to look again, Bill, for the awards that he had and uh, to fit them all on one slide. These are some of the selected awards he received since 1990. And the Nobel Prize here uh, that uh, Dr. Kalin received was Sir Peter Ratcliffe and Greg Semenza uh, was not the last one. Um, just a few weeks ago or a few days ago, actually, he received another award from the BCRF, the Jill Rose Award for Scientific Excellence, and uh, many will be uh, coming. But, you know, it is very hard, and I could talk for a long time uh, about Dr. Kalin, but I want to highlight things specific to Kidney Cancer Research Symposium. Many of you know that he was um, among um, us at KCRS 2019 and decided to stay an extra night in uh, Philadelphia. I don't know if it was the food, paying attention very well here, unlike others on their phone on your right here and really blessed that here with Susan Potit, really blessed us with his uh, presence. And, and that was a couple of days before um, we were about to give medical oncology grand round September 16, so that's two days after KCRS 2019. And that's me sitting here doing the slides next to each other and telling him actually what to do, what slide should be in his talk. So you can see after a couple of minutes, um, his reaction, which is, um, you know, everybody would agree um, with. But my, my slide here is about, if you ask me to pick one thing about Bill, and there are many things that are admirable, including always his uh, choices of restaurants. But the one thing that really stands out that I learn every day from is the rigor, the Bill Kalin rigor, the scientific rigor and the search for the truth always with the rigors that is unwavering. And uh, for many of you, and we have a lot of trainees here, even senior people, these are must read. Um, you know, papers in nature and science about how to conduct research and what to say perhaps and what to publish and how to publish houses of brick, quoting Bill himself here, not mentions of uh, straws. I, I invite you all to read these very, very important uh, paper. And then you will understand Dr. Kalin much better if you don't know him at the you know, on a personal level with his, um, with his work. Uh, so his keynote today is about the studies of VHL gene uh, and how they get us hopefully one day through combinational therapy to cure uh, kidney cancer. And at the end of the talk, we're gonna have a 20 minute, hopefully you can send us, you know, all your question and it will be a dialogue with um, Dr. Uh, Kalin. And I'm going here to unshare my screen and ask Lorna to take over um, and um, Dr. Kalen. Good day, everybody. I'm sorry I'm not uh, with you in person. Uh, here's my disclosure slide, although for today's talk, the most important disclosure is that I have a financial interest in a HIF2 inhibitor that was developed by uh, Peloton Therapeutics, although it's now owned by Merck. Uh, importantly, here are the many talented young people who have worked in my laboratory over the years on von Hippel-Lindau disease. Uh, and here's uh, just a partial list of our uh, many generous uh, collaborators. So my hypothesis is that some of the mutations that occur late during tumor evolution, whether they're driver mutations or passenger mutations, are only tolerated because of the mutations that preceded them. And if that's true, correcting early mutations, uh, that is to say mutations that occurred early during tumor evolution should selectively or preferentially kill uh, tumor cells. Uh, so these would often now be referred to as the so-called initiating or truncal mutations. 
Uh, and in fact, I think there are now a number of examples where we've been successfully targeting truncal mutations uh, in cancer with targeted agents. Uh, here's a partial list uh, shown here. But of course, for today's discussion, we're going to function on the role of the VHL gene in kidney cancer. So first of all, what's the evidence that inactivation of the VHL gene is a truncal mutation in kidney cancer? Well, the first set of observations, of course, comes from the studies of patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease. These are individuals who, of course, have inherited a defective version of the VHL gene from mom or dad. Uh, initially, they're okay because they still have a wild type allele, but we know that over time, they can develop numerous preneoplastic renal cysts. And when you look at the cells lining those cyst cavity, they're now VHL null. So apparently, at least in the human kidney, loss of VHL causes the development of preneoplastic renal cysts. And then over years to decades, these cysts can become actual clear cell renal cell carcinomas, which of course are the most common form of kidney cancer. And when you look at these tumors, they have stereotypical mutations involving other uh, genes. Uh, these presumably re <coughs> represent uh, uh, cooperating events that are important during renal carcinogenesis. So uh, from this, we conclude, conclude that VHL loss is the initiating or truncal mutation at least in the setting of VHL disease, but of course there, the deck has been rigged because there's already a germline VHL mutation. How about in sporadic tumors? Well, here a very similar picture emerges if we look at, for example, the work of Charlie Swanton and coworkers who have done deep sequencing of spatially distinct regions of specific kidney tumors and when possible, including metastatic deposits. Uh, and then have used uh, mutant allele frequencies to infer the evolutionary histories of those tumors. And almost invariably, they again see that loss of VHL is the initiating or truncal event, uh, followed by, again, certain stereotypical mutations. But these later mutations often occur uh, in a branched fashion. That is to say, these are subclonal uh, events, and hence some of these mutations are private to specific subclones. And so again, this reinforces the idea that there are late branch mutations as well as early uh, truncal or initiating mutations. And again, uh, I would argue that perhaps some of these mutations are only tolerated because they've occurred in the context of VHL loss. Now, over the years, we and others showed that the VHL protein is part of a ubiquitin ligase complex that in the presence of oxygen binds directly to the hip alpha subunits and directs their polyubiquilation and hence proteasomal destruction. Whereas when oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein has been mutated, such as typically occurs in kidney cancer, now hip alpha can accumulate, dimerize with its partner protein aren't, and activate uh, various and sundry HIF uh, target genes, such as the well-studied VEGF. Uh, now, uh, over the years, we and others have done sort of uh, necessity and sufficiency experiments that strongly suggest that the driver in these VHL defective kidney cancers is actually uh, HIF2 alpha and not the better studied member of the family HIF1 alpha. Uh, in fact, if you look at preclinical studies, it would appear in at least preclinical models that HIF1 alpha can suppress kidney tumor growth, for example, in uh, orthotopic tumor assays. And we note that in some human kidney tumors, HIF1 alpha is actually downregulated or, or in some cases not even detectable. So again, this has really focused our attention on uh, HIF2 alpha as the bad guy in VHL mutant kidney cancers. So what could we do about this? So fortunately by the 90s, a number of pharmaceutical companies were developing uh, inhibitors against uh, VEGF. And we argued that if VEGF inhibitors were gonna work in any solid tumor, uh, they should work in kidney cancer. Uh, and I think this audience knows very well that that's true, that there are many active VEGF inhibitors for kidney cancer, but some patients don't respond to these drugs and even those that do will eventually relapse. So you would just argue based on first principles, maybe we should be focusing our attention on HIF itself. And based on what I told you, we should be focusing our attention on HIF2 alpha. Unfortunately, the classical dogma was that HIF2 alpha wasn't druggable, but that dogma was ignored by Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner, who were then at UT Southwestern. They uh, identified a potentially druggable pocket in the so-called HIF2 alpha pass B domain. They then did high throughput screens that identified chemical scaffolds that could bind to this pocket and in so doing induce an allosteric change such that HIF2 alpha could no longer bind to ARNT and hence no longer bind to DNA. And these scaffolds were then out licensed to Peloton Therapeutics, which as I mentioned was recently acquired by Merck. 
Uh, Peloton uh, scientists uh, carried out traditional medicinal chemistry efforts to make these uh, scaffolds more drug-like. They improved their potency, their specificity and bioavailability. And they were kind enough to share with us one of these uh, tool compounds from this series, PT2399, that was one or two atoms removed from what was then their uh, lead compound. Uh, and Chin Chou in the lab showed in preclinical models that this uh, tool compound did everything you wanted when administered to BHL mutant kidney cancer cell lines. It decreased hip dependent mRNA, such as VEGF. It decreased proliferation ex vivo, such as in soft agar colony assays. And it decreased orthotopic tumor growth in nude mice. Uh, so that was all very uh, exciting, but the operative word here is decreased, decreased, and decreased. So these are all down assays that you might have achieved with any old toxin. So the question was whether this was really on target or not. And so just to give you an example, uh, here's an experiment done by uh, Chin Cho where uh, she's using a BHL mutant renal carcinoma cell line. She's doing soft agar uh, assays. And you can see when she administered 0.2 or 2 micromolar of this HIF2 inhibitor, she suppressed uh, colony formation. But again, to be fair, I could do this with Clorox bleach or formalin if I adjusted the dose appropriately. So how would you really know this was on target? Well, Chin knew it was on target because she was able to take advantage, advantage again of uh, work done by Bruick and Gardner because they had identified a point mutation in the HIF2 alpha past B domain that prevented the drug from binding to HIF2 alpha, but otherwise left HIF2 alpha intact. And what this allowed her to do was to generate, in fact, isogenic cells using CRISPR that were either wild type for HIF2 alpha or which had this drug resistant HIF2 alpha variant. And, you, and she could see very clearly that if the cells had the drug resistant HIF2 alpha variant, these cells could still form soft agar colonies, even in the face of the HIF2 alpha inhibitor. So this demonstrated that this drug effect was really on target. And in the interest of time, I'll tell you, she was also able to show uh, that this drug resistant variant uh, rescued or reversed the effects of this compound in orthotopic tumor assays. Now, in examining multiple BHL defective kidney cancer cell lines, uh, Chin noticed that some cell lines were uh, sensitive to this HIF2 inhibitor, uh, but others were not, despite an adequate pharmacodynamic response. And when queried further, she found to her surprise that some of these cell lines could tolerate genetic ablation of HIF2 alpha. And you can see that very clearly if you go to, for example, the Broad Institute uh, DETMAP database, uh, where here I'm showing you the enrichment or depletion of HIF2 alpha guides across cell lines of various lineages. So here are the kidney cancer cell lines here, shown in blue. And you can see in many of the lines, depletion of the HIF2 alpha guides in keeping with HIF2 alpha being a dependency in these lines. Uh, but much to our surprise, in some of these cell lines, they could tolerate apparently uh, these HIF2 alpha guides. They did not deplete these HIF2 alpha guides. Now, one focus in the lab has been to try to understand why some of these cell lines are uh, HIF2 independent and others are dependent. Now I'm gonna do a, a bit of a mea culpa here because uh, in Chin's paper, we suggested that perhaps the integrity of the P53 pathway was a determinant of HIF2 alpha dependence, but on further review based on the work of Laura Stransky in my lab, uh, that does not appear to hold up over time. So here what Laura Stransky did was she took a panel of HIF2 alpha dependent lines and a panel of HIF2 alpha independent lines uh, and where indicated, she's added the DNA damaging agent atoposide to induce P53. So for example, in 7860 cells, you can see there's a nice induction of P53, as well as its downstream target, uh, P21. Uh, and initially, again, with a small number of cell lines, it looked like an, an intact P53 pathway was required to be uh, HIP2 dependent. But here, for example, is a cell line that's clearly HIP2 dependent, but you can see this cell line does not induce P53 in response to DNA damage. Conversely, uh, here's an example of a cell line that does induce P53 in response to DNA damage, but it is uh, HIF2 alpha independent. So uh, Laura has corroborated this in other assays, such as soft agar assays. So here, uh, Laura took a HIF2 alpha dependent uh, line uh, and she eliminated P53 altogether uh, using uh, CRISPR. Uh, and yet these cells remain sensitive to uh, PT2399, the HIP2-alpha uh, 
uh, inhibitor. And this is just showing some quantification over on the right. Uh, so at this point, we no longer think that an intact uh, P53 pathway is required for uh, these uh, the HIF2 alpha dependence uh, and is not required for sensitivity to PT2399. Now, eventually, uh, this program led to a, a second generation HIF2 alpha inhibitor, uh, which has now been recently acquired by Merck uh, M MK4682. Uh, th these are so called swimmers plots where each horizontal line is an individual patient and how long they've been on therapy at the time of this analysis. So for orientation, here's one year on therapy. And the black arrows are patients who were continuing on drug doing well at the time of this analysis. Uh, and these yellow stars indicate uh, patients who achieved a partial response and when they achieved that partial response. Uh, so the glass is clearly half full here. Uh, some of the patients seem to be benefiting. I should point out these were heavily pretreated patients. Over 90% of them had failed a VEGF inhibitor and over 70% had failed an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And based on these data, uh, this drug has gone into phase three trials, uh, but clearly some of the patients did not respond. And so we have to think about what we can do for these patients. So uh, one approach would be to exploit the idea of synthetic lethality. So you may know that two genes, we'll call them A and B, are synthetically lethal if mutations in either gene alone are compatible with viability, but mutations in both genes simultaneously leads to cell death. And so, so an idea that was first put forth by Lee Hartwell and Steve Friend was to use this to identify uh, new targets in cancer. The idea being if the A gene was a gene mutated in cancer, uh, then the B gene might be a good drug target because in principle, the inhibitor of the B gene would selectively or preferentially kill the cells that had the sensitizing mutation. Now as drawn here, this is sort of digital. You're either alive or dead. In actual practice, it's more analog. You're either more fit or less fit, but even those sorts of quantitative differences might be exploitable in the clinic. So there's been a lot of excitement to do uh, synthetic lethal screens in mammalian cells. And for the past decade, a lot of those screens went like this. You had cells that were wild type for the gene of interest or mutant for the gene of interest. You would then infect them with a hairpin library or perhaps more recently with a CRISPR guide library. And you would isolate genomic DNA at early time points and late time points, and then use deep sequencing to monitor the abundance of the hairpins or the CRISPR guides. And you would look for hairpins or guides that were preferentially depleted in the mutant cells. So that, that all sounded fine as drawn on the blackboard, but in actual practice, most of these uh, uh, screens were not very productive. And I think in hindsight, there were several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's always harder to see a loss of something than a gain of something from a statistical point of view. So these assays are always a little bit noisy because you're looking for loss of a hairpin or loss of a CRISPR guide. Uh, secondly, even just doing two independent infections introduces some noise into these uh, screens. And then finally, if you look at the, the details in the methods section, even when these cell lines were intended to be isogenic, they seldom really were. If you stop to consider uh, the heterogeneity even within a given uh, cell line. So the minute you isolate individual clones from a cancer cell line, uh, they, there may be additional passenger mutations that are private to that subclone, and hence these cells are really seldom truly isogenic. So the simple adaptation that we've come up with is whenever possible to do a single infection, and we tend to like uh, CRISPR because we think it has fewer off-target effects. Uh, so we engineer tumor cells that express Cas9. We infect with a CRISPR library under wild type or pseudo wild type conditions. I'll give you an example in a moment. And then after editing has occurred, we split the cells 50-50 to continue under the wild type conditions or we switch to the mutant conditions. And we've done this now successfully for VHL, RB1 and IDH1. And I should also point out that whenever possible, we like to complement these uh, CRISPR screens uh, with similar synthetic lethal screens that we now do in a RAID format with chemical compound libraries using well annotated compounds and isogenic human cells. And we especially also like doing synthetic lethal screens in Drosophila cells uh, using RNAi and isogenic Drosophila cells. And, and the Drosophila has two advantages. One is if a synthetic lethal interaction is present in both human cells and Drosophila cells, it's likely to be highly robust. And then secondly, this takes advantage of the fact that there are many uh, genes in humans that are, uh, have multiple paralogs because of gene amplification events that occur during evolution, uh, whereas often those same genes are present as a single gene 
and Drosophila cells. And so as a result, uh, sometimes you get false negatives in human uh, screens because of parallel compensation, but you will see those as true positives if you could do the, the equivalent screen in Drosophila cells. So Hillary Nicholson, in the, when she was in the lab, made VHL null renal carcinoma cells that express Cas9 and a DOX-inducible VHL. She infected them under the cover of DOX and then split them to continue under DOX or she removed the DOX. In parallel, she did a similar screen where instead of having an inducible VHL, she treated the cells with that HIF2-alpha inhibitor I mentioned a moment ago. Now, in fairness, uh, VHL does do other things other than suppress HIF2, but certainly one of the major things it does is to suppress HIF2. So this was another way of starting to get at synthetic lethality that could be driven by deregulation of HIF2. Now, one of the true positives from Hillary's screen was CDK4 and its paralog uh, CDK6. Uh, so in Drosophila cells, the ancestral gene for these two paralogs scored uh, using isogenic human cells that were VHL minus or plus uh, several chemical inhibitors against CDK4 and 6 scored. Uh, in her human CRISPR screen that I outlined for you, where she was able to control VHL with DOCs, uh, Cyclin D1, the partner for CDK4 and 6 scored. Uh, parenthetically, CDK4 and 6 did not score in this screen uh, because of that paralog compensation problem I was referring to a moment ago. So CDK4 and CDK6 were largely redundant in Hillary's hands. And finally, and somewhat interestingly, this synthetic lethality between VHL and CDK4 and 6 appears to be a HIF independent. So just to show you what a validation experiment might look like, seven, uh, Hillary took 7860 cells, which are VHL defective, and she either reintroduced VHL together with tomato red, or she simply introduced GFP, uh, but these cells remain VHL defective. She mixed them one-to-one -one and then treated them with the CDK4 or 6 inhibitor. Here she's using a bembocyclib, but she saw similar things with palbocyclib. And you see an outgrowth of the VHL proficient cells at the expense of the VHL defective cells. Uh, this was also true in vivo. So here I'm showing you survival curves from mice. Uh, these are nude mice that had orthotopic tumors formed by 7860 cells. This is a HIF2 dependent line. Or UMRC2 cells, this is a HIF2 independent line. Uh, but again, remember that I told you this synthetic lethality is not driven by HIF2. Uh, Hillary treated the cells with a uh, CDK4-6 inhibitor, in this case, palbocyclid, for 28 days by oral gavage. And in both cases, you can see an improvement in overall uh, survival. Uh, now, I mentioned that this uh, synthetic lethality is not driven by HIF-2, and that allowed Hillary to ask whether combining a HIF-2 inhibitor with a CDK4-6 inhibitor would be additive or synergistic. So now I'm going back to those competition experiments where we have uh, VHL positive cells that are tomato red, uh, and the VHL defective cells are expressing green fluorescent protein. So we're looking at the outgrowth of the VHL proficient cells. And you can see in the open bars, if you now add the HIF2 inhibitor, you'll see even more dramatic uh, enrichment of the VHL plus cells. So that was true in these two HIF2 dependent lines. In contrast, if she does this with the HIF2 independent lines, such as UMRC2 or 769P, she still sees the uh, effect of the CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor, palbocyclib, uh, but there's now no additional uh, benefit of adding uh, PT2399. Uh, or, and so I think here, this is, con again, consistent with the fact that these cells are HIF2 uh, independent. <clears throat> now, I should also point out, most importantly, there's no evidence of antagonism between uh, these two drugs. So at best, in a HIF2 dependent line, you might get an additive or, syn or synergistic effect. Uh, but at least in the HIF2 independent lines, there's no evidence for uh, antagonism combining PT2399 with palbocyclone. Uh, now, Hillary began to model uh, th this combination again in uh, new mice orthotopic tumor assays where now the cells have been engineered to express luciferase, so you can easily monitor uh, their growth. Uh, and at this point, there's a, there's a clear trend in favor of the combination. Uh, and I should also point out that when Hillary did necropsy for some of the animals that received the combination, they had no detectable viable uh, tumor. So based on these data, uh, a clinical trial is planned. <clears throat>
Now, one other possible advantage of adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor into the mix for kidney cancer therapy is that there have been a number of papers that have suggested that a CDK4-6 inhibitor might enhance the activity of cancer immunotherapeutic uh, drugs, uh, such as the checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Now, I'll do my second uh, mea culpa because I must say I had grown into a bit of a, uh, a cancer immunoskeptic given how many uh, immunotherapy strategies had been proposed over the years that never really uh, panned out when tested uh, in the clinic. Uh, but I think as this audience well knows, that uh, began to change with the development of checkpoint inhibitors such as ipilimumab or the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Uh, these are the data from the treatment of melanoma patients with this drug. Uh, and what was very gratifying was to see there seemed to be a benefit, benefit, albeit modest, if you received the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. But perhaps more importantly, there was also a suggestion of a tail here. Now, I guess you could have argued, well, we've always known melanoma is a bit of an immunogenic tumor. But to me, what was perhaps more eye-opening was to see these checkpoint inhibitors begin to work in diseases like non-small cell lung cancer, which were never thought of as being particularly immunogenic. So here I'm showing you spider plots from an early clinical trial, or clinical trial of uh, nivolumab in non-small cell lung cancer. And you can see that again, some of these patients clearly appear to benefit. Now, again, as this audience probably well knows, uh, checkpoint inhibitors do seem to have a role in the treatment of kidney cancer. Here's an early uh, registration trial, I believe, of nivolumab compared to uh, everolimus in patients who had failed frontline uh, therapies in, with, with kidney cancer. And you can see an improvement with the addition, or with, with the use of nivolumab compared to the benchmark at the time, everolimus. And more recently, uh, my colleague, Tony Chiori, presented these data, I think at the ESMO meeting, showing that the combination of nivolumab with cabozantinib, uh, and, you, and you may know that chemizatinib inhibits both the VEGF receptor and MET, uh, is, was superior to what was thought of as at least a, a, a possible frontline comparator, namely uh, sunitinib. And so I think uh, as of 2020, the trend seems to be moving towards the combination of a checkpoint inhibitor uh, with a VEGF uh, R inhibitor. Uh, now, in closing, I want to stay uh, for a moment further on the uh, on the immunotherapy front. So many of you probably have seen this slide. This shows the mutational burden across many different cancer types. Uh, melanoma, of course, is at the extreme over here, and it's thought that that helps explain the response of melanomas to immunotherapy. But over here is clear cell uh, kidney cancer, and you can see it's sort of stuck here in the middle, and yet we know these are immunogenic uh, tumors. So what might be going on here? So one possible clue comes from work done at the National Cancer Institute uh, many years ago where they were treating patients with advanced kidney cancer with allogeneic stem cells transplants as a source of uh, immunocompetent cells. And gratifyingly, some of the patients had either a complete response or a partial response. And work done by Richard Childs and coworkers found that at least in one of the CR patients, that patient now had uh, kidney cancer reactive uh, T cells that were able to recognize a Tenmer peptide derived from a uh, endogenous retrovirus called HERVE. And they noted that HERV is restricted to clear cell renal cell carcinomas and is not detectable in normal tissues or other cancers. And uh, others have begun to also uh, establish a correlation between the responsiveness of clear cell renal cell carcinomas to immune checkpoint inhibitors and the expression of endogenous retroviruses. Now, Childs and coworkers went on to show that at least for this HERVE, uh, that its high expression is driven by HIF2, which of course is a consequence of uh, VHL loss. And unlike most endogenous retroviruses, this endogenous retrovirus is at least partially translated, hence the peptide that was recognized by the uh, immune cells. And Chin Chin Jiang in my laboratory has now been systematically looking for other ERVs that might have similar properties and has identified a number of endogenous retroviruses that are similarly uh, induced by HIF. Uh, and we think this is exciting because this opens up a new avenue for potentially pharmacologically altering the expression of ERVs in human tumors and hence their responsiveness to immune checkpoint uh, blockade. So in closing, I want to come back to this waterfall plot. I said the glass was half full uh, because some of the patients were responding, but it was also half empty because some of them were not. 
But I also mentioned these were heavily pretreated uh, patients. Um, again, most of them had failed a VEGF inhibitor and an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And so one might wonder how would this HIF2 inhibitor have fared if it was used more towards a frontline setting and in patients who perhaps had a lower uh, disease burden. Now, fortunately, we were able to convince Peloton to test this very same inhibitor in patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease who had measurable kidney tumors that were being monitored in careful surveillance programs in an attempt to delay or prevent uh, the need for repeated nephrectomies. Uh, so eventually this led to this phase two trial uh, that was presented this year by Eric uh, Yonash. Uh, gratifyingly, about 87% of them had some measurable tumor shrinkage uh, and about 40% of the patients had a uh, partial response that was either confirmed or was uh, awaiting independent confirmation. The median progression-free survival has not been reached and the 12-month progression-free survival is 98.3%. Uh, now, as these patients have BHL disease, Many of them also had, uh, uh, for example, hemangioblastomas of the retina, cerebellum, or spine, as well as other tumors, such as uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine uh, tumors. And again, the indicator lesion to get on the trial was to have at least one measurable kidney tumor, but these other tumors were monitored as well. And it's very gratifying that some responses have been seen in these other uh, incidental tumors. So now this is what the uh, waterfall, excuse me, the, the swimmer spot looks like for the VHL uh, trial. Uh, and so now you can see that um, most of the patients have been on therapy for over a year and most of them appear to be doing well at the time of this analysis. And many of them have gone on to have a confirmed partial response in gold or uh, at this point, unconfirmed partial response in orange. Uh, but since statistics can be a bit dry, I thought I would end with uh, a, a video to kind of put a human face uh, on this, if I can. Hey, everybody, it's Justin. I just wanted to give you a quick update. I am in a gondola right now in uh, Taiwan. Over there is Taipei 101. Uh, the gondola is actually right by the Taipei Zoo. But I just wanted to give you a quick update and uh, say I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my trip. If it wasn't for the PT2977 drug trial, I would have never been able to come out here and do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I just want to thank Peloton, and I hope Merck will fast track this drug for a VHL treatment. Um, so if you guys are listening, hopefully you guys will put it on the market to help VHL. But uh, yeah, keep uh, watching these videos. I'll be making more, and I'll, I'll get better at it, and I have to get the angles right because it kind of looks fat, you know? <laughs> Anyways, I'll show you some of the views. Um, Anyway, I, lo I, I love this vlog for multiple reasons, one of which is at that age, that's the kind of thing you should be worried about. You should be worried whether you look fat in your vlog and not, not be worrying more about what your next CAT scan is going to look like. Uh, so with that, I will thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope I have the opportunity to answer some questions. Thank you. Bill, thank you so much. You want to put um, maybe the video on. Hi, Bill. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Good, good. Virtually. Thank you so, so much. We have 20, 25 minutes together here with my co-chair, Hans Hammers, and with uh, uh, Brian Lewis. And, um, you know, there's a lot of questions that came along, and I, I was debating, you know, what to ask you. Ask you about Bill Kalin ask about science in general or ask about renal cells. So I'm gonna ask about all of them, but I'm gonna start by um, renal cells. So Bill, you're a medical oncologist. You did your fellowship here at Dana-Farber and um, you know, you're still involved with the clinical development. What is your next clinical trial? Well, as I mentioned, and as you well know, Tony, because uh, you are my, uh, what are your, my, your twin sons of different mothers, you know, you are my other half. So, uh, you know, I'm very excited about the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Let's see if they, in fact, have some activity, and if so, whether they can be combined with other agents. So that's sort of the next one I'm looking for. Uh, and then I'm hoping we're smart about how to integrate the HIF-2 inhibitor into the management of kidney cancer care. You know, I think you and I share optimism that it will certainly work in sort of the salvage 
setting, but the, especially the VHL trial uh, reinforces my belief that we should think about whether this drug should be used in the front line, perhaps in combination with other agents. In fact, I'll, I'll make a stronger statement. I don't think it's perhaps. I think almost certainly, you know, if we're going to get to cures, it has to be combinations. And so I think you can start to see the makings of a, a combination in time that would include three or four drugs. But if I was a betting person, I would say the HIP2 inhibitor would be part and of that's how we keep it, uh, solid tumor. Yeah. I agree. Um, before going to the Bill Kaling, because I have some funny stories I'm uh -oh. sure you want to share with the 400 people on. Um, but these papers back to back, which, you know, I, I read was a lot of admiration about some of the, I want to call it a bit of sloppiness in publications. So for the whole field, building, not building mentions of uh, straw, knowing that we're all, you know, pushed in academia to publish yes. and be productive, et cetera. But what's your take on the field and what's the remedy for that? Or this is a trend that hopefully will stop one day. Well, I certainly hope it will stop one day. So let's just start with the easy part. You know, I, uh, I now I'm on the board of directors at Lilly. So I actually get to see other therapeutic areas as well and in some cases learn from other therapeutic areas. I think when, when uh, targets and the corresponding drugs succeed in clinical trials, usually, but not always, but usually there was reasonable genetic evidence, preferably in people in the form of natural genetic variants or, a, or in a well done mouse study that, that really linked the target to the phenotype that you were interested in. So think, for example, of hypomorphic PCSK9 mutations in the general population as a clue that PCSK9 controlled cholesterol. Uh, think about uh, somatic mutations in various uh, cancer. You know, most of the successful targeted agents, the, the cancers are, had already provided us some genetic uh, evidence implicating those targets. And then in addition to some form of genetic validation, you know, some biological insights into what the target actually does. So, you know, when the BRAF mutations were identified in melanoma, we already had a pretty good understanding of what BRAF did and how it signaled and what some of its out outputs were. So, you know, I think th that's the secret sauce that it's, it's, it's always risky to develop new drugs, but if you could start with some measure of genetic validation and a, a reasonable biological knowledge, that helps a lot. In fact, I would say the, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are very informative in this regard. I mentioned I was an immunoskeptic but a lot of the early strategies were based on, you know, phenotypic assays and sort of, you know, doing things that were really weren't as genetically informed as the CTLA-4 and PD-1s of the world, because we knew from mouse knockout studies that uh, CTLA-4 and, and PDL one were, and PD-1 were sort of rheostats on the immune system. So I think that was very helpful information that informed the work, of course, of Jim Allison and others uh, who then championed bringing these forward as uh, therapeutics in man. So I think uh, genetic validation, biological knowledge, and then, you know, I think we have to all remind each other, each other that, you know, we're in this for a reason and to, it's not about where the paper publishes, it's whether it's true enough that your colleagues can reproduce it and build upon it. And I know that sounds like mom and apple pie, but sadly some people easily forget that. And I understand the pressures to you know, get the paper out and, and, and pull a fast one on reviewer three. But in the end of the day, you don't want to look back on your career and say, that's what you did, but no one ever could build upon anything you ever reported. So I, I think I, I, I realize it sounds like I'm on a soapbox and, and believe me, it was easy to write these pieces because I probably have made most of these mistakes myself over the years. So I don't, you know, I, I if I'm, you know, so I, I think I just sharing uh, my painful lessons over the, over time. These, these are available, you know, you know, all, so we're going to circulate them. I think they're now available, uh, all the PDF. One thing about Bill Kalin, I keep hearing, uh, this is more personal. So one is in the distant past, was it your first lab or your first experience in the lab around medical school? I think you weren't destined for greatness. No. Uh, by, so I want you to talk little about this and especially your experience a day before the phone call at four in the morning about your experience. Oh, no. So now you're really going to get me in trouble, Tony. So I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to have to do some, I'm going to do some real-time censoring of these questions. But uh, 
So, so let's let's do the one though, because I think it's maybe a little lesson for the young people, if we have some young people on the call, because it is true that in my first lab experience, it was a complete disaster, and I was given a project that was, I will tell you, in the benefit of hindsight, uninteresting, unimportant, and undoable, which is a very bad combination for a young person first setting in the laboratory. And then when I correctly told my professor at, towards the end of my uh, tenure with him that this project was based on an artifact and that this project would never be uh, completed, in my opinion, as a 17 year old or 18 year old or whatever I was, uh, he rewarded me with a C minus and he wrote a note in the margin of my transcript that Mr. Kalen appears to be a bright young man whose future lies outside of the laboratory. So I always like to tell young people, you know, if you're struggling in a laboratory, uh, the problem might be you, but it might be that you're simply in the wrong laboratory with the wrong uh, mentor. And so uh, I think uh, I was very fortunate to uh, land in David Livingston's lab when I did. And of course, David was uh, just the opposite of that first experience. I was given a great project to work on and I had a great mentor who was able to teach me how to be a scientist. Okay. <laughs> We'll leave it there. Yeah, I think we're going to leave it there yeah. in terms of other so, incriminating stories. I want uh, Brian or Hans. There's a lot of question coming from the audience. I don't know, Hans. Uh, you can pick uh, some of them. I can see them in the chat box. So one question I thought that came up that I think is quite interesting. You mentioned the association of the HIF2 activity and the expression of the human endogenous retrovirus, yes. i.e induction of antigenicity. You also mentioned the need for upfront combination therapy. Yes. Are you worried about combining HIF2 upfront with immune checkpoint inhibitors and maybe interfering with their success? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one I'm thinking about every day. Uh, so one of my colleagues years ago told me, if you're smart enough, you can always think of a reason why something will fail. And uh, my corollary is, if you can think of at least one reason why something will fail, you probably don't understand what you're doing. So uh, you're absolutely correct. Based on just uh, first principles, you might imagine that uh, it would be counterproductive to combine a HIF2 inhibitor with a checkpoint inhibitor if this model is correct. And what you're really doing is then downregulating ERBs and making the tumors less immunogenic. However, as you well know, sometimes when you combine drugs, you get benefits in other ways. So for another, another view would be that even within a given kidney tumor, you have some degree of heterogeneity. Perhaps you have some cells that would have been sensitive to a HIF2 inhibitor, but would never have responded to the checkpoint inhibitor. And there were other subpopulations of cells that always would have responded to a checkpoint inhibitor, but would not have responded to a HIF2 inhibitor. So you still get an additive effect by combining the two drugs. So I don't know what the answer is going to be. Uh, we certainly have our eyes wide open uh, and we are concerned about this. The, the other way to get around this potentially would be to think about sequential approaches that maybe you get some cytoreduction reduction with cocktail A and then you come back in immediately with your checkpoint inhibitors would be another way to get around that. I guess the final thing I will tell you is we are learning other ways to maybe pharmacologically manipulate uh, ERV expression for the good, if you will if this model is correct. So, you know, I think we're still learning the rules, uh, but if we're clever, maybe there's even a way we can maintain the ERV expression while still knocking down HIP2. Bill, one question came from the audience uh, twice. Um, designing a lab experiment, would you uh, look at a very large tumor, like in humans, you look at it in mice to look at an effect there, or do you treat at a small size to see an effect? Well, I think, I think uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, one of the many things David taught me was every experiment starts with what's the question. And if you tell me the question, uh, then I can start to think about what the right experiment is. Uh, a second principle is that uh, if you're going to introduce a bias into your experiment, it's always better if the bias is working against you rather than uh, for you. And, and so we keep uh, that in mind. So, uh, and then finally, you know, what, what is it you're really going to try to model? So I guess to answer that, that particular question, I, you know, I think just for practical reasons, we usually start uh, therapy when tumors are relatively small. And I guess the thinking there would be, if you don't see a signal there, you're, you're unlikely to see a signal in a very large 
uh, tumor. But I think if you do see a signal in the smaller tumor models, you can start to press it a little bit, see if you can model what would have happened if you were treated later in the course of the disease with larger uh, uh, tumor burdens. But again, there, let's be honest, there are real limits to mouse models. And you know, they, we, uh, they, we, have, we would have to sack most of our mice long before they even came close to something reflecting in a, a patient with end-stage metastatic renal cancer. Um, Brian, I know Brian may have a couple of questions. Uh, my question is not scientific, and there are a lot of good questions going on in the chat and in the Q&A, but um, Dr. Kalen, is there any chance, my, my daughter put me up this, to this, is there any chance that we might be able to see your, your Nobel Prize medal? Well, I, I was tipped off that I, I might get such a request, so I don't usually walk around with this in my back pocket, but I did, I did bring it out. So here, here is the. Oh, is she, now is she is she there? Did you say? No, but I'm taking a screenshot. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll take a screenshot. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There's sure. some really good questions going on from the from the from the audience. So I'll let, turn it back over to Tony and and, and let him continue. So. Thank you. One interesting question, Bill, a very unique activating mechanism of HIF-1 that is not true for HIF-2 so that we can combine rationally a therapy of a HIF-1 activating a drug with a HIF-2 inhibitor? You know, I think that is an interesting idea. Uh, I, I, I must say I hadn't thought of it though, uh, but it, it, might, it, it might be possible. It might be possible. Uh, I think that's a very clever, uh, clever idea. You know, I'll ch I'll cheat and answer a related question that came across uh, in the Q and A, and I answered in real time. It is true that there have been some mouse models that have implicated HIF one alpha as either being necessary or sufficient for renal cancer in the mouse, uh, and so this has led to a lively debate whether HIF one is or is not. Uh, acting as a tumor suppressor uh, in human renal cancer. And so I was asked, how can it be that in the mouse, uh, apparently, for example, HIF-1-alpha could be required for renal carcinogenesis? I think there are at least two possibilities. Uh, one is that perhaps this, the cell of origin that's really being targeted in these mouse models is not truly the equivalent of the cell that gives rise to VHL null renal cancer in humans. That's possibility number one. Possibility number two is maybe HIF-1 does promote tumor genesis during the very earliest stages of renal carcinogenesis, but then flips into a tumor suppressor. And uh, I think back to early work done by uh, Peter Ratcliffe and colleagues who showed that HIF-1-alpha could be detected in the various, very earliest renal lesions forming in VHL patients, but then when they got more atypical and showed more dysplasia, you saw a, a decrease in HIF-1 and an increase in HIF-2. But maybe HIF-1 was still important during those very earliest initiating uh, uh, days. So uh, that would be uh, another uh, explanation. And then finally, we should, we should keep in mind that uh, we've known for decades that you know, the rules in mice and the rules in people are different. So if you, make a, if you carry a germline RB mutation and you're a human being, uh, you're gonna be at risk for retinoblastoma uh, but if you make a mouse that's heterozygous for RB, you, they don't develop retinoblastoma until you introduce a, a variety of other genetic tricks to force them to develop retinoblastoma. They actually develop uh, pituitary and thyroid uh, neuroendocrine tumors instead. So, you know, clearly the wiring is a little bit different between mice and people and, and context matters. Very good. We have a couple of minutes, two minutes left. Hans, uh, anything? from your side taking a couple of questions. We'll finish it uh, with you, Hans. Yeah, there, there, was, a, there was another um, audience questions about the, um, the cell autonomous effects of HIF-2. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you think is the major cell autonomous effect of HIF-2? Again, the person who asked is a former lab member of yours, I think is very interested in that answer. You know, I don't know all of the cell autonomous uh, downstream targets of HIF-2, but the, but the one that is always near the top of my list and another reason why I'm interested in CDK4-6 inhibitors is cyclin D1. So, uh, you know, Rick Klausner showed many years ago that uh, VHL loss upregulates cyclin D1 
in clear cell renal carcinomas, but frankly, in most tissues, HIF down regulates cyclin D1. So there's something, again, we talked about context mattered a moment ago. There's something special about the cells that can give rise to clear cell renal cell carcinoma that HIF2 upregulates cyclin D1. Uh, and my former postdoc, Haifeng Yang, showed years ago that uh, knocking down cyclin D1 in a renal carcinoma cell uh, suppresses tumor genesis in nude mice. So, you know, we start to get that, you know, start to credential cyclin D1 as one of the autonomous drivers of renal cancer uh, proliferation. Uh, but, you know, clearly there are others we, we think about uh, as well, but I think that's probably the one at the top of my list. Very good. Um, we're six o'clock, uh, five o'clock, sorry, uh, six o'clock in the uh, ocean. Uh, so Bill, thank you so much. And thank you for being part of KCRS 19, the first one and KCRS 20 and hopefully KCRS 21. Uh, Brian, you wanna say last word before moving to the next session? Yes, Dr. Kalen, thank you very much. We really appreciate all that you're doing for all of us um, really Great to hear all of this. I, I wish um, I knew how to how to you know, interpret a lot of the, the science that you're talking about. But it, it makes all of us as patients know that uh, you know you all are out on the forefront uh, looking for this cure. So you give us hope. So thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate your time. Well, thank thank you as well. I can't tell you how inspirational it is to hear patients cheerleading for us and rooting us on because we have our moments of despair and frustration and you bring it all back to us, why we do this and your inspirations to us. And this is just the beginning, Bill, till we cure it. Yeah, it's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalen. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who's uh, listening in today. You know, we'd love for you to keep the conversation going on, um, you know, across Twitter at hashtag KCRS20. And uh, it's now my pleasure to take us into our official session one going to be led by Dr. Naomi Haas from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as uh, Eric Yonash from uh, MD Anderson. And we're talking about the next frontier, new molecular targets for kidney cancer. So Eric and Naomi, take us into the next frontier. <laughs>